it's a, a good thing and a bad thing all rolled up in one. <laughs> um, but they do actually uh, employ me to go to beekeepers all over the state and run the certified honey card writing. So part of that is we work with presidents of bee clubs to get people certified. And if uh, people choose not to go uh, join a bee club, some people are like that, um, I do work with uh, individuals to get them certified. And a lot of that program, the main goal is to just um, combat some of this out-of-state and out-of-country honey that people are trying to sell as Kentucky honey. Um, we're not against people bringing honey in, but um, selling it as if it were Kentucky honey and taking that away from the cons both the consumer and the beekeeper is what we're trying to do. Um, Take care of it. So that's the purpose of the program. Um, but tonight we are talking about aurora mites. And every time I give this talk, I start off by asking people, how many actually know what aurora mite is? That's good. I've had a room of 50 people before and none of them knew what they were. Which kind of scary. Um, so aurora mite is your number one killer of honeybee colonies across the world. So everybody has to deal with aurora mites now. They actually started on something called uh, Apis serrata, which is the Asian honeybee. And while she looks very similar to our honeybees, she's actually not. Um, she doesn't like to nest in a, a box very well. They really like trees and other types of nesting sites. And they also are very, very hygienic. So when we say that honeybees are very hygienic on the insect scale, but uh, Apis serrata is even more hygienic than honeybees, and they're actually able to take these mites and get them off of them and get rid of them much faster. So they actually learned how to adapt and work with these mites, but the European honeybee hasn't. Um, the varroa mite actually causes a lot of problems within the honeybee. It can weaken the immune system overall. That's because this mite is actually become a fat body, which is the main immune function or immune, immune system organ in the bee. Um, it can actually uh, shorten the, the lifespan, spread over 23 different viruses, including the deformed wing virus, which is shown in this picture. Um, the bad thing is, is that most of these viruses, while we can detect them and we know they're there, we don't actually know what they're doing to the bee. So you may have a whole bunch of viruses in your bees and not know them. Um, it will also change the behavior of how the workers interact with each other and how well the foragers are actually foraging. And it will kill immature bees if you get too many mice in a cell as the bee is developing. So this is a, a picture of a larvae that's been pulled out of the cell and has mice already feeding on it. But you can kind of think of mice, or these mice as a tick. They feed on the bee, but if they were a, a, a tick, it would be the size of a dinner plate on you. So if you have anything the size of a dinner plate being on you, you know that you're going to have problems with it, and so do bees. So for our life cycle, it's um, cycling from work in, in place with the bees. So up here, your plant is laying your egg, and your nurse bee starts to feed that larvae. And these mites are going to ride around until they're mature and they know when that nurse bee is going to start tapping over that cell. As she starts tapping that cell, the mice are going to jump off of her and run and bury herself down in the food that my, that is going to be feeding on. She knows this because she doesn't want to be sensed by that nurse bee. Some bees have actually developed and been able to smell the mice and they'll reject that cell and, and make it so that the, the mice can't reproduce. So that's something to call the aurora sensitive hygiene. But in this case, she's going to be down, bury herself, and that cell is going to get capped over. Then we're going to, um, she's going to start immediately laying eggs. The first eggs that she lays is a male, and then she's going to lay two female eggs as long as this is a regular worker that, that develops in 21 days. Those brothers and sisters, when they're going to make, yes, they're highly embraced, but they figured out how to uh, make things work that way. And they're going to continue to go up and start feeding on that larvae into the pupae as, it, uh, as that pupae is developing. So they're going to start by weakening that bee right from the very beginning before it's even emerged to become 
adults. They continue to feed, and then they're going to emerge. So every time a mite starts um, the cycle, one mite is then going to turn into three mites. So that's something to keep in mind as we go on. Because this is how you quickly expand your numbers when you're fighting about mites. In your worker cells, that's 21 days, you can quickly go from two mites to four mites to eight mites to 16 mites. So you can see really quickly how you become overrun with all these mites. Plus, a drug cell, you get three extra days. So you actually get three females as opposed to just two. And um, the, the mites can actually sense what is uh, the drug total. And they will go and flock to the drone home. And that's kind of the principle of having those green frames that we'll discuss them later uh, on how to use that drone home properly in order to trap these mites. They have a whole seasonal cycle that goes along with these. I promise this is the only graph I'm going to show you all. Um, but on the bottom here is the, the uh, time of the year that these bees are going. And then on the uh, y axis is the the population of the bees. Your blue line is your bee population, and the orange line is your mite population. So here, this is probably right around in August, in that area when your bees, are, you have the most bees within your hive. But the bad thing is that now, this time of year, your, your bee population is starting to start decreasing, preparing for winter. They're going to start that transition over into winter bees. But your mite population is increasing. So those bees that you need to live the longest, right, your winter bees are going to live almost six months, are going to be more weakened by having a higher mite load. That's something really important to think of as we, we, we discuss these mites, is because you don't want all of those winter bees to have that weakened immune system. That's going to shorten their uh, capability of being able to overwinter. I hear all the time, I don't need a test because I can look at my eyes see whether or not there's four mites in there. Well, if only were that simple. These pictures, it's really easy. You can see the little mite there feeding. They really love to feed on the place in between the abdomen. So that's um, where these mites are actually attaching right here. Sometimes you can see them up on the thorax too. And those are really easy to see. But how about here? You think there's mites in those pictures? They actually are. So one is right here up underneath this leg, but it blends in and it hides up underneath this plate to the bee. And you actually have another one that's really well hidden right over in there. So, but from a distance, you're not going to see that, particularly when you're talking about 30 or 40,000 of them right around a box. You're not going to notice whether or not those mites are in there. So people fuss all the time. I don't need to worry about them. I don't see them. You're not going to see them. Um, so, you know, you can automatically assume that mites are there. It's not if you have mites, it's how many mites you have. We also have a problem with miticide resistance. So I'm going to discuss a little bit with some of the different treatment options, but one thing to keep in mind is that if you select one mite treatment and you treat these mites, we're going to say right here you have them, you're going to wipe out a good portion of the population, but not necessarily all of them. And that's when we start having miticide resistance. If you continue using that same treatment, it doesn't matter which one it is, you're going to start selecting for mites that are resistant to that treatment. And so even though you keep treating them and you spend a lot of money on your mite treatments, all you're doing is selecting mite resistant, uh, miticide resistant mites. So one thing to keep in mind is you've always got to rotate. Um, I use products depending on the time of year, and I always rotate a, through a series of them to make sure I'm not getting any mitocide resistance in the process of that. So here, continue through. All of those mites are actually mites, uh, resistant to this treatment, but you cannot come out with a different treatment. I also hear all the time that I'm not going to treat because I'm selecting for bees that are resistant to mites. Well, I wish it was that simple. Because we would all do it, and we would be able to move on, and we wouldn't have a mic problem anymore. But unfortunately, well, there are some of the groups that are actually uh, breeding genetics to fight mites that I will discuss here in a little bit. But by and large, unless you have some kind of active breeding program, you're not going to be able to select 
network resistant mites. One thing to keep in mind is that you're not replacing, you can't select the resistance at an individual B level. You have to do it at an entire colony level, right? Because your queen has, is only going to be bred at the beginning of her life. Her genetics aren't going to change, and therefore the genetics of your colony are not going to change unless you start requeening and you actually have an active program. So the, the concept that I'll just wait it out and my, my hives are going to work, or if they're going to sort it out themselves, is kind of a flawed idea. And part of the problem with that is the mites are going to pile up in your hive because you're going to have them. And then when your hive fails, not if, but when it fails, you now have an entire colony that's full of mites. And what happens with all of those other bees colonies in the area? Well, start robbing them. Yeah, you've got to look at the horror bombs because everybody's neighbors are going to run over, start cleaning up that hive, and they're going to take out the honey, the copelets, any other goodies they can get, but they're also going to infect themselves with mites and take them back home. So even if you're very diligent at keeping up with mite treatments, if your neighbor isn't, you're fighting a losing battle. You know, as soon as your treatments are done, they may go to another hive, rob it out, and bring all these mites back home. So we have a variety of testing methods that are out there. Um, I should have brought something back, or my kit, but I actually left it down where my bees are down here, so I forgot to that one. But um, you can buy this for an easy check. It was actually developed by Phil Kraft. I don't know if any of y'all really know who he is. Yeah. Oh, you do? Okay. Um, and um, there's $20 a day. Very easy to get a hold of. They're really easy to use. Um, it's got a little measuring mark inside. You can fill that full of bees. And then you hit them with whatever media you're going to do your testing with. And I'll talk about that in, very shortly. But this is what I use right here. All of this is a mason jar. And I'm sewing a baggie out of sports cloth. Uh, and I, I use that to make check for uh, mites in my, my yards. You can also use the powdered sugar system. One thing to keep in mind though is powdered sugar is not as effective as some of your other media, such as alcohol or soap. Um, people feel better because it doesn't kill as many bees, but uh, if any of your alcohol or soap methods are going to kill bees. But I really try to think of it as like a, a blood test, right? Your blood's important. You have to have it, but you give part of it in order to be able to check to see what's wrong with you, or make sure everything's okay with you. And that's really the same concept as, as we have. It's the super organism or the entire colony that matters, not the cup full of bees that we're going to use to test with. Everybody's collecting kit can be a little bit different. This is my initial kit. Um, you can actually buy this from Featherbee. And that's using the powdered sugar method. Um, all I do is set the cup up. I use about a third of a cup of bees. Their goal is to get around 300 of them. And uh, I use alcohol, so I pour alcohol in on the top of that. I cap the jar and give it a really good shake. And all of your mites will fall to the bottom. Um, and you just pull bees in. And then you do your count set. If you're using the powdered sugar method, you have to <coughs> You pour your bees in, you pour the powdered sugar over the top of them, and you have a string lid that you use over the top of the jar, and then you pour that um, powdered sugar into a plate, and you dissolve the powdered sugar with water and count your mice that way. So that's kind of the difference uh, between the two. Since I almost exclusively use the alcohol wash, I find it easy, I keep several jars, I pour my bees in as I'm, I'm doing each colony, I cap it over, give it a good shake, and I actually can count it through the jar and keep it for later if I decide I want to recount or make sure something's, um, everything I'm doing is correct. So, and that's just the method I use, but it's really whatever method you choose. Yes? It says going through all this effort, but you know, you're saying everybody's got mites, mm -hmm. and you need to rotate your treatments. Why don't you just Assume that you've got mites and rotate your treatments. What you, good is doing a count if you're already doing the best thing you can do anyway? Well, part of that is any of your mite treatments are going to be harsh on your bees. So if you can decrease the amount of mite treatments that you need to do, that's advantageous to your bees because in the end you're not going to kill an arthropod and arthropod, right? I can't quite say insect because a mite is an insect. But uh, unfortunately they're so similar that any of these mite treatments are going to have an effect on your bees. 
So if you can decrease the amount of chemicals you have to use on them, that's better for your bees. Additionally, any of these kind of tests can help make sure that your treatment options are working. Um, so I periodic, I test about once a month, even though I can treat two to three times a year. But I, I continually do that to make sure my numbers are staying low. And I also make sure to do it directly after I finish a treatment, when those my numbers are supposed to be at their lowest point, just to make sure that treatment works. Because if it doesn't, you've got to rethink your plan and figure out what, either why it didn't work or make sure to do something else. If you say um, right after a treatment, you mean like um, the next day or the next week or? It, it's a relative time frame. It doesn't have to be a uh, you know, real specific time. I'm going to leave your view in the system. Um, let's see. Oh, I use a collecting vessel. Um, if you've ever seen Tammy Potter do a my test treatment, I actually, in the end, went up adopting her system. And when you, when you use a uh, collection thing like this, everybody in the eight year gets mad. The entire eight year tends to be a little mad side. Uh, using Tammy's method, she will actually use a measuring cup and just run it up the frame. And she's very gentle. Nobody gets mad. I was very shocked at the differences between the systems. <laughs> but after that, that's just your method of collecting the bees. After that, it all goes into a similar system. Um, so we are You want a jar for holding them, um, or if you use that uh, Rora check, it already comes with everything you need right there together. Uh, some kind of sieve, um, a measuring cup, alcohol, soapy water, powdered sugar. I use alcohol. Um, you can just go buy your straight ice purple alcohol, which is just fine. It doesn't have to be anything too special. Um, your soapy water works as long as you put enough soap in it. You want to have a decent amount of soap that's going to um, damage the cuticle of the bees and actually kill them that way. Um, and then the powdered sugar, while it doesn't directly kill the bees, most of them are going to probably die anyway. You're just not going to see it. Um, powdered sugar clogs all of the trachea of those bees, right? Because the trachea are actually in the abdomen of the bee. And um, it can actually cause problems with their breathing. So they're probably going to die anyway. You're just not going to immediately see it. And people like to have it. Yes. How many bees do you catch? Around 300. 300. It's the goal. Mm -hmm. um, in order to do this, you're going to select a frame that has nurse bees on it. So this is a frame that's definitely ready to get capped over. Now, your queen might be on that frame if you don't watch it. So you've got to make sure you've got your queen and she is somewhere else. Um, in order to make sure you do this without killing your queen. Um, but you don't want to go and select a cap frame of brood because mines aren't going to care about that frame. They're already capped over. They're not going to get in the cells. They're not worried about it anymore. Um, then you're going to scoop out um, here and say a quarter between a half cup. It's usually around a third. The goal is to get around 300 bees. And you're going to place them into your collecting jar. You're going to quickly add whatever medium you're using to do the test, whether it's alcohol. Uh, a long time ago, we used to use ether. We don't need to use ether. But, uh, but you'll actually see it called ether roll sometimes. And, uh, or your soapy water, powdered sugar. Then you're going to shake everything up and start counting your mites. If you've used the powdered sugar method, you're going to dump them down into your plate. <coughs> and uh, water to dissolve, dissolve the sugar in order to see and then you're going to count your price. Um, this is for every 100 bees tested, just to keep that in mind. And so usually you're trying to get around 300, but if you get less than that, uh, you can still use this metric to be able to measure them. Um, we're going, we, would, we want a larger number of bees simply just because that's when your statistics of uh, the your colony actually start to the, the number of mites that you're collecting this way really starts to compare to the overall mites in the hive. That's how these numbers are selected. Um, if you're early in the year, something like March or late in the year, November, you should have pretty low mite numbers. You're, if you find one, you're okay. You don't really need to do anything. If you 
either buying two or more, you need to really start thinking about how you're going to control those mites. By the time you've got number three, you've got to make sure you're using some kind of chemical method to get those mites under control. Typically, you shouldn't have a huge problem in the spring, right? Because you're coming off of a broodless period, or at least a low brood period. So hopefully, you're not having a major mite problem. Why would you have low mites in the late fall? I would think you would have, a, unless you did a treatment, I would think you would have more mites per 100 bees then than any other time of the year. You could, if you're not even under control. I mean, typically in the spring is when you're going to have your lowest mite numbers. Um, if you have a high mite population, or a high bee population, so this is going to be your time of August, or, you know, right now we're on the bee line, um, you're going to have two mites per, uh, and no pests. You have three to five mites, you need to really start thinking about what your mite control options are. And if you have five mites or more, you need to have some kind of immediate control. Ideally, I'm here, I said I test about every month, but you want to test about at least four times a year, particularly after you do the treatment, just to make sure that you're getting those mite numbers down. Um, also to make sure that if you don't need to treat, um, here in a second, I'll give you a uh, website from the Honeybee Health Coalition, and they will go through and they will tell you all of the advantages and disadvantages to every mite treatment out there. And they actually have some really handy tools now to help you make the best decision on how, what kind of mite care you want to do and how much effort you want to put in. But um, in that, they'll let you know, you know, if you use oxalic acid too many times in a row, you might damage your queen, you might damage and so depending on the time of year, you may not want to use that method because of the effects that it can have um, on your hive. If you have, you know, one, if you're using a treatment method that can damage your queen very readily, you may not want to use that in the late fall because it's very hard to requeen in the fall and you may lose a hive. So those are some of the things you want to think about and there's different advantages. Um, there are what we call IPM methods, so integrated pest management. And the goal of integrated pest management is to use the least amount of chemicals possible. That doesn't mean you're not using chemicals. You're just trying to put a lot of cultural practices together to use before you turn to any chemicals. Um, one of the ways to do that is using uh, resistant beads. So we have two that are readily available here. Uh, one of them is called the fluorescence of the hygiene. That's where the bees can actually smell the fluor mite under the cell, and they will choose to eject that larvae. They'll get rid of the larvae, they'll get rid of the mites, they get rid of everything, and they're able to keep their mite numbers much lower that way. Another way is through the Purdue bees. They call them mite biters. They originally called them ankle biters, and then they decided they didn't like that name. So now they're mite biters. And, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about them in just a minute, uh, and I've got some cool videos for you. Um, you can also use drum pump. That's usually that fluorescent green comb that you buy at Day Dance. And um, it has a larger cell, so rather than the bees deciding when they want to build worker comb, they're going to draw out a drum comb on that entire frame. Those are really handy if you want like, a very hands-on method and you don't want to use any chemicals. But you have to be very diligent at being in your hives. If you're a hands-off beekeeper and you don't get in your hive very often, that form of aurora management is a catastrophe. Um, you put it in there, you've got to remove it two weeks later. Because any eggs laying in that frame are going to develop, mites are going to go in with them, and if you don't pull it before that 24 days is over, you've now just had an explosion of the mites in your hive. So, don't use that method if you are not going to stay on top of it. <laughs> what do you do with that frame after you pull it? You burn it? Or? No, you put it in the freezer, um, fill it for a week, pull it out, scratch the cells open, get it back to these, then clean them up, and just start the whole process over again. So, um, it's, just, it, it's a continuous cycle, you just have to be very hands on. Um, you can use spray bottom boards, but they're not really ideal by themselves. They're helpful, but they, they're not going to just eliminate the problem for you. Um, another good option. 
break the group cycle. Sometimes they just remove the queen for a while and then give her back. Um, so if you do that, you have to do full requeening procedure, so you can't just re release or you won't acknowledge her that way. Um, all that does is break up that brood cycle. If you split frequently, you can also minimize your roar mites. Now keep in mind, that's going to hurt your honey production. So if you're in this for honey production, that may not be your best method. What, how, how long do those mites live? Uh, you know, once they've come out of that, uh, come out of that uh, brood chamber um, as, a, as a new... Yeah, they can run around for a, over a month on those bees. Um, actually, what they, that cycle is called a floridic mite, so it's not actually feeding them at one time. And it is critical to be a part of that life cycle. So it rides around on the bee for a while, and it can go over a month before it decides to go back down in and start actually laying uh, eggs again and start the cycle over. So she can go for quite a while um, compared to bees. So if you, if you have a short break in the, uh, in the brood cycle, all that's going to do is stop the reproduction during that time period, right? Correct. Right. Yeah, it's not going to actually eliminate your, uh, eliminate your life problem. You're absolutely correct. Um, let's see. I'm not figure out what this is. So this is some of the Purdue mite buyers, and you might actually, this video is very fascinating. So there's a mite on the end of those corsets. And that's actually what they do with it. They actually go over and they grab the mites and they start chewing their legs off. And because they are, uh, you know, all bees and mites, as soon as they have any injury to their body, they can't stop bleeding. So when the mite or the bees start pulling those legs off or chewing on the sides of them, they bleed to death. And now they're done. So you have the bite on the frame there. So it's not happy, but it gets away from me. Is this in real speed or is this sped up? No, it's a real speed. It's a real speed. <laughs> You're going to chew on it again for a while and she drop it. But she still thinks it's on. There it goes right back up again. If one of these get on the bee, will one get it off them? They typically will get it off themselves, but sometimes they will help each other.
but it's only for just a couple of days. <coughs> it had to be below 85 for like two days after you. After it is the first couple of days of your treatment. Um, you do hear in your neck and flow, you can, the only two options are Mite Away and Hump Guard. Originally, I feel like acid was included in that, but it has, has been removed since then. So it must be doing something into your honey supers. Uh, or people were trying to use the fumigation method, and so they just removed it. Um, they, at that point in time, it used to be that you could use the drip method for it. Uh, but I will say, I have not heard a lot of positive reviews about Hump Guard. So I would use that with caution. Because it doesn't work or because it's destructive on the bees? Um, I've heard it does not work very well. Okay. Um, I think by the time you get a high enough dose that it doesn't work well, it is very hard on the bees. Um, oxalic acid is one of those things that people love to use. Everywhere I go, people just love oxalic acid. And it is a great product. But one thing you have to keep in mind about it is that while all of those other products that I've just listed beforehand all penetrate the cavity, so they actually kill the mites in the cells themselves, oxalic acid does not do that. It only is killing mites on bees that are riding around in the hive. Um, because of that, it actually is really great to use in like November or December um, to really keep your mite numbers low. You're getting you know, you've kept them low all year, and now you're giving the final blow to them and making sure that you're killing as many of them as possible. You can use them other times of the year. It's just not as effective. And keep it, this is actually one of the products that doesn't necessarily get a lot of resistance to it because of how it, um, it it's a physical method that's actually killing the mite. So the crystals are getting in the mite and scratching them, and that's how they're dying. But keep in mind that uh, one of the popular ways to use it is to use the fumigation three times in a row. Well, that means you've just now exposed your bees three times in a row to that mite treatment, which is really hard. So I think you need to evaluate if it's really that great of a product to be able to use that often and give that much stress to your bees. It might be better to use one of these other methods and use uh, oxalic acid at the best time of year for. That's my opinion on it, but people are allowed to use products as they wish. Um, there are things that don't work. Um, I showed to you why visual inspection doesn't work. Um, people also like to paint bullet casings and pull out individual cells of brood. That doesn't work because you're not getting the high enough sample. Just because you go through and you pull three or four cells and there's not mites in them, doesn't mean you don't have mites somewhere else in your house. Um, the small cell cell foundation is actually shown not to work as well now. So that, that's recently been moved over onto that. Um, things that don't work. Um, low doses of mineral oil also don't work. Along with different kinds of acids like lactic acid, for instance. You have the two popular ones, oxalic acid and formic acid, and those work really well. But a lot of their other acids don't work. David, did you say you use the, uh, the mineral oil? Yeah. But you're using the fogger, which is a higher yeah. concentration of it. She corrected me on that a while back. <laughs> <laughs> on some of my understanding of how that worked. That was before we had our meeting here. <laughs> you said you treated them like three weeks in a row yeah. in the spring and then again in the fall? Yeah. That's what you're I not think. the first person I've heard that says, <laughs> says they use that if mm -hmm. they really like it. So it may be that there's not enough testing going on. Um, that would be, a, you know, it's not harmful to your bees. You know, it doesn't contaminate your honey. So if that works, using the fodder. So the, the harmful to your bees is relative because it's coating the bee, right? And any time it coats that abdomen, it's cutting off the airway from bee. So it, it's something to keep in mind, but I don't think they firmly have to get to run it early enough. But I, you, I have heard that people use it and love it. <coughs> So that's not an effective treatment. 
But there are people that love it, and that's all they use. Okay, but there is enough studies out there that show that, that specifically and, does and not. How is it effective of getting the mics off when you're doing your account? So that's because it's a very high concentration, and it's causing the mites to reject the like reject out of the, the concentrated bees, right? So it's making them release from being up in, under that abdomen, and that's why they're falling down in the sugar. The concept works, only it's the bees are falling in various places and then crawling right back onto the bee. Um, that's why it works when you're doing that test, but it's not working when you actually throw it throughout the whole class. Um, people have used various spice treatments. Um, the cinnamon might work for ants. I've heard people say that. But uh, it's not effective for mice. Um, here's a uh, list of stuff from Hold Community Health Coalition. They have an entire guide to varora management. They're going to tell you the ins and outs of the best methods to use, your more hands on methods to use, your more chemical methods to use. I mean, it really is the most uh, concentrated guide of all of your options as far as how to control these mites. Um, they also have a variety of new tools that they're coming out on a daily basis. So um, it's, it's something really cool to use. They'll actually help you select which chemical is right for you through their whole little guide for it. So um, I can't say enough good things about these, this group right here. And they're also doing what they call a mitophone right now. Um, trying to get people to test for mites, and they're hoping that you're going to test for them and then upload your data into their database. The reason is, is that they can then use that data to get an idea of how much mites are really affecting people across the country, how big people's mite loads are, what methods they're using to control them, and are they working. Um, there's really, outside of some of those public source meetings, there's not any really good way to know that. You can do it in the research lab, but it's, it doesn't translate the same out uh, as it does out to people in the public. So, you know, they're just trying to get an idea of how everybody's working and how big of a problem this really is. Um, in summary, everybody needs to have a Aurora control plan, and that's going to be different for every person. If you want to be really hands-on and use fewer chemicals, you can do that. You just have to have a plan of how you're going to keep those mic numbers under control. Um, you need to test for early after treatment, at least several times a year. Know how many mites you have Let's go, uh, in your hive because you know, you know they're going to be there. And you need to treat if you decide it's the, you, you've got too many mites or if you just want to automatically treat for them. But you need to be treating to make sure you keep those mites low. So it's not only killing your hive, but it's not killing everybody else's. As more and more of these mite resistant uh, hives, um, you know, the, the, the Purdue queens and, and things like that, as they become more and more uh, percentage of your population, you would think that your hives that are susceptible to the are going to die out, and these other hives are going to survive. So they would just kind of. That's your hope. <laughs> but. Who, where, where do most people buy the queens from here? Most of them are coming from Georgia and Florida and Texas, and they're not using any of these traits. They're just going out and using the bees in the yard and they're breeding from them. So the pro part of the problem is, is that people don't want to pay for it. These Purdue queens, um, to buy a breeder queen is $350. They actually, to get the offspring off of them, um, to just use a normal regular colonies run around $45 to $50. So they're a lot more expensive than people don't want to pay for them. I mean, and that's okay, but they don't, a lot of people don't understand what all it takes to actually get <coughs> these queens. So your actual breed of queens that run for $350, the reason they're that expensive is because they're being artificially inseminated. So they're going through, they're selecting drones that are known to have carry that mite resistant trait and then they're artificially breeding these queens to make sure that trait goes forward. Uh, otherwise, it's very random, right? The queen probably is not going to mate from her own apiary, and you know, since she's mating with 20 drums that she's probably you know not related to in any way, shape, or form, the chance of keeping that trait going becomes harder. <coughs> uh, see, this is 
it a problem then that, that, these, um, that these special bees are being kind of inbred? I worry about that, um, to be honest with you. Um, but now they have turned their focus on trying to find these wild types, and they're crossing any of these Purdue bees, for instance, back with these wild types in order to, and that's trying to increase that genetic diversity. So while essentially, originally I was a little reluctant, I mean, I thought it was great. I love that they could find it and start selecting for it. I was, I was worried about the genetic bottleneck, but now because they're outcrossing, um, I still think the wild types are probably going to be better, but uh, you know this is this is the way to start handling it. It's probably not going to be the end all be all, but it's it's a forward progress. <clears throat> um, so a lot of this was put together from out of Sylvie, my master's degree in Claire Shaw's lab at the University of Kentucky, and Joseph Palmer actually helped a lot too. He's um, now working over at KSU though, so he's he's moved on as well. Um, also, as I said before at the beginning, you know, I'm a program manager of certified honey, so if you'd like your hive certified, we can work on that. That's not a problem. And um, the KSBA is really trying to improve uh, their working relationships with local bee clubs and all that kind of stuff. So if you all have any questions about the KSBA, anything you would like the KSBA to be able to start doing, 